Hi, I'm Nora O'Donnell, and this is Person to Person. Our guest today is Boston Marathon bombing survivor Adrian Haslett. Ten years ago, a terror attack at the famed Boston Marathon changed the city and Adrian Haslett forever. Haslett, a professional ballroom dancer, was a spectator near the finish line when a bomb went off, causing her to lose part of her left leg. Her recovery has been difficult, but she's also become the face of resilience and fierceness. She's not only learned to dance again, but she's finished the world's oldest annual marathon twice. One of her proudest achievements is bringing a paradivision to the famous race. So we sat down with Haslett for an intimate person to person about strength during hard times. Adrian, it is so good to see you in person. How are you? I am good, Nora. It's so wonderful to see you in person. We're friends on Instagram. Yes, yes, we are. We're always <laughs> cheering each other on, and you've been a part of so many of my milestones, so thank you for having me. Oh, my goodness. How have you been able to turn tragedy into triumph? I think it's about focusing on the good and focusing on helping others that are going through the hard stuff, because none of us escape this life unscathed. And you don't have to go through what I've gone through to realize that we're gonna face the hard things. And the only way, in my opinion, to really move through it and to perhaps triumph is to face it head on. And that means face the hard stuff and the hard emotions and the PTSD as well. It's hard to believe it has been 10 years since the Boston Marathon bombing. It is so hard to believe. I hear you say that and I wanna correct you. Like, I, I don't know what I'd correct you to, whether that would be last year or 20 years ago, but it just doesn't feel like 10 years. What lessons have you learned since then? Gosh, I think I've learned that when someone tells you something can't be done, it's a reflection of their limitations and not yours. I've learned that on the days you need to be in the fetal position and sob, you should do that. Mm -hmm. We have gotten to know each other over the past 10 years. We've even been running together. We have. But there have been some ups and there have been some downs. Absolutely, yeah. This has been woof of a roller coaster. I mean, I can feel my chest tighten and loosen when I think about that. I think about the Adrian that was in the courthouse that faced the monster that did this. I think about the Adrian that was hit by a car and leveled um, and gravely injured and disabled again, hardly have any movement in my, my left arm and, and a lot of damage to my leg. This is while you were training to run the Boston Marathon, a it big was. step for you, and then you were hit by a car. It was, yeah. It was in poetic, I suppose, in a bad poetry kind of way. It was 100 days out from the Boston Marathon in 2019. Um, it was gonna be my second Boston, and I'd really trained really hard, and trained in 2018, and didn't finish because of weather and, and hypothermia. Training 2019 was like, you got this, you got this, and slammed by a car. It was horrific. How did you recover from that mentally? You know, Nora, I think the more time that passes, the more I realize that I have some deep PTSD from that that I have yet to figure out. More than the Boston Marathon I, bombing? Right now, yes. I don't know if I could compare the two right after, but when the bombing happened, the world stopped and said, this isn't okay. I was hit on the 5th of January and 40 some odd people had already been hit that year. And so many people get hit by cars every day that I just feel like it's such a problem that's reoccurring. And I feel like it's such an injustice that not a lot has been done for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's part of it that I need to work through. You can hear it in my voice. Um, but the more time that passes, the more I realize that, that time is definitely gonna benefit me to get away from that, mm -hmm. that moment. You have documented for the world to see your physical recovery. Yeah. And now I know you spend most of your professional life talking about that, but also mentally how you've gained so much strength. And I think for me watching you do that, that's what's so incredibly inspirational. Because well, people you. experience all different levels of setbacks in their mm -hmm. lives. You have had more than your fair share. Yeah. And, and yet you've emerged from it, it seems like even stronger and able to help other people. Thank if you. someone is having a really tough time right now, what would you say to them? You know, I think I would tell them feel it all. 
If you want to have a pillow to punch, punch a pillow. If you're laughing at the television when you feel like you should be crying, laugh. I know when I try and bury it or move through it or ignore it, that's when I feel like it's, it's just weighing on me and I can feel my shoulders start to go up to my ears and, and it just feels, it feels too heavy to carry. The nation will commemorate 10 years since the Boston Marathon bombing at the finish line. But I know for you, you're thinking of that every day? I am. You know, I had, uh, all of us survivors were brought um, in with 9-11 survivors and family members uh, at the one year anniversary to talk about, they were brought in for us to talk about what it's like to have a very public anniversary of a trauma. And I'm so glad that the city of Boston organized that because a gentleman by the name of Tim, I'll never forget him, he approached me after and he said, Adrian, you should know anniversaries are only for people who forget. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, anniversaries are for people who forget because they'll say, oh, it's been 10 years. Gosh, I remember where I was. And yes, that was tragic. And they'll remember and recognize that. But for those of us that have been through it on a Tuesday night, when we get a certain smell woof through the air, or we hear a certain song, or we feel a certain pain in a part of our body um, or triggered, it can hurt just as much as an anniversary. So yes, anniversaries are important, but it still hurts on a Monday morning. Mm -hmm. Since you and I have talked over the years, one of the things that always struck me is you said you don't want to think of yourself as a victim. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you not feel badly for yourself or feel sorry for yourself or feel like, why did this happen to me? You know, it's hard. I don't think, why me? Why me? Why did this happen to me? Um, I did for a short time think, why on earth would someone do this? And my therapist finally looked at me and he said, Adrian, you shouldn't understand that. And I was like, oh, okay, right. Yeah. Um, I don't sit around and think, why me? I think it's about, what am I gonna do now? That terrorist only had me for 3.5 seconds. That's how long that blast took to blast through the air. After that, it was up to me. It was up to my first responders on that sidewalk. It was up to the tourniquets that were tied around me. It was up to the EMTs and firemen and my Superman surgeon and the city of Boston and so many others to lift me up. So I don't think of that monster having me for any more than 3.5 seconds. After that, it's been up to me. I read that you said that, and that struck me so powerfully, that that bombing was three and a half seconds, but you are responsible for yeah. every second after that in your life. Yeah, that's how I end every talk. My life changed in 3.5 seconds, but it's up to you to make every single second count after, because believe me, they do. I also read about some of the lessons that um, you impart to others. And one of them you said is share your goals, yeah. say them out loud. Why is yeah. that so important? You know, when I did that initial interview saying that I wanted to run the Boston Marathon and learn how to dance again, learn how to run. I said those dreams out loud. I did not remember there were cameras right there when I was saying those because I was in a state of trauma. Uh, but I'm so glad I did because I was held accountable and my Superman surgeon believed that I could do it. My family believed I could do it. People believed I could do it. And I think when you say those dreams out loud, it's so important because we are so good at self-doubting. I also think that by saying it out loud, you also not only had people help hold you accountable and help you mm -hmm. towards that goal. But then I think you probably even surpassed your wildest dreams. Without and those doubt. of us watching you, I mean, you trained for the Boston Marathon with Shalane Flanagan, like the greatest ever. It's still pinch me. I mean, I feel like I need to see it on a screen or something to, people will come up to me on the street and they said, I loved watching you with Shalane. And I'll say, was that real? Was that real? Like and that not actually even train happened. with her, run with her. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what a pinch me moment, Nora, to stand at the start line of the famed Boston Marathon with your name on your bib and have other para athletes next to you. And there were tons of different blades and toes on that start line, towing the line. And then to look beside me and have Queen Bee Shalane Flanagan uh, next to me, dressed in the exact same outfit with the exact same nail color um, and braids and ready to go. It was a total dream. It feels still unreal. Um, but yes, I surpassed my own goals when I when other people believe in you, and and Shalane's a, a testament to that. What did you learn from her? Oof, I learned to have fun in the process. Our main goal, because I've had so many setbacks, our main goal was to get to the start line healthy, and then if if we get to run after that, like heck yeah, it's a party. Let's do it. Let's shoot for the moon. But we just wanted to get to the start line healthy. So I think I learned to enjoy the process, which is fitting because I've had to learn how to enjoy the process of loving my body again.
and loving, you know, the process of walking again and dancing again and doing these things. Just she taught me how to love the process and giggle while training. It's hard. She worked me to my bones, uh, but <laughs> okay. we giggled still. I was nervous for you because oh. I mean, I was like, yeah. oh my God, that's Shalane Flanagan. Like I run maybe like a mile with her, you know, just for fun and thinking, oh my gosh, this is so intense because she's so incredibly amazing. And you guys did the whole marathon and you exceeded her expectations. Well, thank you. I, she's very kind to say that. I, I will tell you it's, if I could put it into words, it's like lining up next to a Ferrari and then learning that you're going to do this together. And you're like, <laughs> I'm going to be so disappointing. I'm just going to be so disappointing. My motor is so different than hers. Mm -hmm. um, but she, we started running and she goes, all right, just relax those shoulders. I'm just here by your side. It's your marathon. I'm just here to cheer you on. And she was so good about that the entirety of training. All right. When we come back, we're going to talk more with Adrienne Haslett about how she prioritizes her mental health. Adrian, the last time we spoke, you talked about how you are fiercely protective of your mental health. What does yeah. that look like? That looks like prioritizing sleep um, around my day, not doing my whole day and then getting sleep in between. It means therapy is my priority, no matter what opportunity comes up. If I need to move therapy, that's fine, but I won't skip it. It means that when someone approaches me in the grocery store and says, I know where I was that day, and I saw X, Y, Z on the sidewalk, which happens a lot because mm. it's a shared trauma and that they get very gruesome and they don't mean it bad, but it also means looking at them and saying, I was there too and I can't hear that right now. Wow. Instead of, I was there too and I'm not your therapist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, do you say that? I may have done it when I needed more sleep. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, and no. yeah, I mean, I just, I just think you can tell, I, I can tell now who really needs to let it out because they just don't know who to talk to about it and they see me being open and, and everything with, with how I talk about it mm -hmm. and they say, oh, I'm just gonna talk to this person and they just let it out and I'm like, I can't, I can't be that for you. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that goes over under, with people understanding and sometimes it doesn't and that has to be okay. And I think one of the most valuable lessons I've learned with mental health and all of this is to observe and not absorb. So it's similar to if you're standing at the, at the start line of a race, you're observing everybody else's nervousness, but that's theirs. That's not mine to take on. And if somebody else is unloading on me about what they saw on the sidewalk or how they're handling it or how they would have handled the trial differently or something, I'll just go, wow, that's a lot of energy that person has. All Observe, right. Observe, but not absorb. Yeah, because I used to, Nora, I used to, even the night before our first interview, I just, someone said something to me, I don't even remember what it was, but my gosh, it triggered me. I was up all night and it wasn't anything, they didn't mean anything, you know, but you just, right. if you absorb the other people's things and people will say like, how do you do this for a living and speak about it? And then after at the meet and greets, they'll tell you what their worst scenario is in their life. Um, and I welcome the talk about it, right? Yes. That's important, but it's also important for me to be like, all right, that's theirs and I can offer empathy, absolutely, but I don't need to absorb it. You and I have talked about anger in the past. Yeah. Are you still angry? I'm angry that people were hurt. I'm angry that he did it, but I don't live in the anger anymore. Definitely. That's, that's it's a change for It's you. a very big change for me, yeah. That comes with the observe, don't absorb. Um, that's taken some time, but I don't feel this, I don't feel any like everyday anger of that happening, which feels, really nice. Yeah. Um, that was a shift for sure. And I think, you know, running helps, good friendships help, good relationships help. Fred absolutely helps. <laughs> looking at his face when I applied for a service dog, they said, what are you looking for? And I immediately said, someone to make it all better. And they said, Adrian, that doesn't exist. And then I met Fred. Um, and Fred so you, along with- You said your goal out loud and it came it true. It came true, exactly. <laughs> That's all, just need a dog, everything's fine. Uh, but I do, I think, I think I don't feel that rage anger. And I know through Fred that if I'm feeling frustrated at him, I know that means I have to check myself. Mm -hmm. Some people left Boston after the bombing, but you decided to stay. Why? I did decide to stay. I did think very hard about getting a farm in the middle of nowhere and just retiring with a bunch of goats and mini cows. Um, and that sounded lovely, and it still does some days, but I wanted to stay. I felt the love from the city. I felt the giant embrace and how tight they were holding all of us survivors and me. Um, I felt uh, the love pouring out. I 
had a really good therapist and leg guy and my Superman surgeon, and then I was like, well, now I can't leave. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, now I can't leave. I just, it's impossible. And I, it, again, the place isn't as much of a PTSD for me, um, but the loud noises are, and those loud noises would happen almost anywhere I would be, so mm -hmm. I, I don't think of Boston being a bad spot. Even after I was hit by that car, I still didn't think, I'm out of here. Well. You're the epitome of Boston Strong. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. When we come back, we'll talk about what is next for you, including an IMAX movie. That's yes. next. And we're back with Adrian Haslett. It's so good to talk to you and learn so much from you, as so many people do, as I know you're out on the road talking. I know one of your early goals was to run the Boston Marathon. What does running mean to you? You know, it means an expression of strength. It means a choice of giving it instead of giving in. It means to use my body in the ways that I still can. And there are so many things that I can still do. And I think, you know, when I was that broken shell of myself, um, laying in that hospital bed, looking at this new body, having used my body as my tool as a professional ballroom dancer, I thought, I can't do anything. I'm just gonna sit in an easy chair and eat Cheetos and watch TV for the rest of my life. And at the time, I didn't even own a TV. So I just thought that would <laughs> sounds awful. Um, just because I was always dancing and I didn't wanna just sit in one spot for the rest of my life. And so I think running is a, is a real expression of what I can still do. And it feels wonderful to just be able to sweat and push my body in a way that I never imagined possible, ever, ever imagined possible. I think of something too my trainer says at the end of every workout, you know, be grateful for the ability to move your body. Absolutely. So simple, but it like, is. yes, I am yeah. so grateful for the ability to move my body. Absolutely. And, yeah. and to have lungs that will carry you and to have feet, even though mine are two different feet and different than the most, mm -hmm. you know, I'm still fully capable and I want to show others that they're fully capable. That's so, so important to me. Um, and, and it's a huge thank you. I mean, I don't think I'm particularly special in my strength. I think that I'm just a reflection of the Boston Strong movement that was poured into me. You know, Boston Strong came from everybody else. We were just in, in the hospital bed holding on for our lives, but the Boston Strong movement was what I absorbed and that I'm just, I feel like just a result of that. Now, what role will you have in this year's marathon? I am so excited. I am trying to make a decision right now, which this is a very privileged problem to have. Um, I've been invited to stand at the finish line to greet the Grand Marshal, uh, the King himself, David Ortiz, uh, as he rolls down the marathon route and uh, help place the trophy at the finish line, um, which would be incredible. Uh, and then I also have been invited by Team Honda to ride it in the lead vehicle with the women and watch the women's race in the back of the vehicle and watch every move that those pro women make. So that's a really good problem to have. I'm not sure exactly which one I'm going to choose yet, but I'm very excited. I should make my choice right here right now. I think it'll be pro women. <laughs> I mean, those are two good choices. They are. Have. And what inspiration to watch those women push themselves. I mean, I remember watching Shalane and just being so inspired. Yes. It's going to inspire me to run next year, I'm sure. Yes. And now an IMAX movie. Pinch me. What is that? Tell me about that. I am so honored. The main character of the film is New England. It leads in with this little girl watching a movie in her aunt's house of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, and you're wondering why you're watching this little girl watch this movie of Fred and Ginger and fall in love with ballroom dancing and then have the bombing happen and learn to run and then run the marathon. So I've been working with them for the past five years to film this and training and dancing and childhood and... Uh, it just feels like a real pinch me moment, not because I'm in it, but because I remember as a child going and seeing IMAX movies. And I just know that little kids will go there on field trips and see bodies like mine and the other para-athletes doing something strong and hope that that destigmatizes people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So that little girl is you yeah. as a dreamer. Yeah, I was a dreamer. I saw Ginger Rogers on that screen and I thought, I want to be Ginger Rogers when I grow up. And I, I set that initial goal at about seven years old. You have done so much. You have been a successful ballroom dancer. You've run the Boston Marathon. You speak at so many professional organizations and inspire so many people. Thank you. What's your next goal? I want to finish my book. Oh. So if anyone's looking out there as a literary agent, 
uh, <laughs> currently shopping. Just putting that out there. Um, you I'm gotta, halfway. You gotta put your goals out. There. I gotta put your goals out loud. Um, no, I've, I've, I have some publishers that are interested, and I, I'm um, about halfway done. So if I can ever sit still long enough to finish it, you'd think I would have done that during quarantine, but it did not happen. Uh, so to finish that and tell the story, there's a untold story that I have not told anyone about who I first thought of um, on that sidewalk. I think you've asked me the question, and I've, I've very kindly and regrettably but purposefully white lied in the sense and, and admitting that in my truth um, about who I thought of. Um, I, I'll say that I initially thought of my birth mom, and she's no longer with us, so I want to tell that story. I was adopted, and some people know that part of me, um, but there's a massive story about that um, and what happened to her in a very similar way, and I, I want to tell that story. So, wow, that feels like a lot to say, but um, that's the book. It's why and how I'm able to be as strong as I am. Whew. Um, it's a big story, and I, I want to be able to tell it and tell her truth. Um, and you knew the story important. of yeah. your birth mom. It's the first person I thought of. It's why I rolled over. Wow, that wasn't going to come out today, but yes. Um, it's very important to tell that story. She deserves it. I do what I do because of her. Wow. Yeah. Well, that book should come out on Mother's Day. It really should. That's a wonderful idea. I love that idea. Um, I love her, and I am, I am really grateful to be here and grateful that uh, I can live my life for her. Whew. Adrian Haslett, wow. Thank you, as always. Thank you. Clearly, you're my safe space, because I would never say that with anyone else. <laughs> well, I'm happy to be, and because you inspire me. Thank you very much.